and welcome for today's uh, presentation. Hopefully everyone had a, a real nice uh, and uh, uh, Easter weekend and uh, spring is here. It's gonna get hot this week and you know, it's hard to believe already 90 plus degrees temperature, but that's weather it changes here in South Texas on a heartbeat. So while y'all guys are uh, chatting in your questions, so uh, uh, you can put your name where you're chatting from, that does help. And your specific uh, a question that you might need a little bit help. So while y'all are doing that, I threw a couple of seasonal slides in here while Ruby and Denise gets the questions put in order here. Uh, lawns, since we grow warm season lawns here, uh, turf grasses, uh, such as St. Augustine, Bermuda, and Zosia. Uh, we're hitting the time frame right now, folks, uh, which is going to be very, very vital to fertilize and add supplement uh, nutrition. This is the ideal time. And usually we say once you give your lawn a second or third mowing uh, with a well-maintained mower with sharp blades, uh, this would be the ideal time to get that slow release. That's the key for springtime. Slow release fertilizer put out. We've been recommending the 1959 for 42 years. So it's a proven fertilizer, uh, great on your spring and fall uh, vegetable garden, as well as your trees and shrubs, flower beds uh, in early March when everything's starting to bud and start push out. But Get it out here on your lawns, uh, all your independent nurseries in and around the area, as well as a lot of the feed stores have it. It's what we call a 3-1-2 or 4-1-2 ratio, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So do get it out as soon as possible. And we also wanna share a few, our first of the 2021 Texas Superstar uh, plant releases. Um, San Antonio has always been the hub of not only tomato trials, but also plant releases via the Texas Superstar Plant Program. And Celebrity, we're officially recognized in Celebrity as a Texas Superstar. So Celebrity was introduced by Dr. Jerry Parsons when he was doing a tomato trials as a number series. But this tomato has been around so long that it was here before the Texas Superstar program started. So we decided, hey, we've been using Celebrity uh, as the, the lead tomato when we do all these tomato trials and what tomato can be as good as Celebrity. And we like Tycoon and we like Valley Cat. Those three are what we uh, consider controlled tomatoes. So get your tomatoes in the ground this week. If you have not done your spring, uh, planting of warm season crops, plant them in sun, fertilize them, cage them up, weed management, good watering, mulch in May. Hopefully you can grow tomatoes as big as I do right there. And then uh, looking for quality tomatoes, a celebrity, Tycoon, Valley Cat and others that Extension recommends to have 15 to 30 plus pounds in fruit. So we'll go ahead and get started, Ruby, if you guys are ready. Uh, sure thing, David. Let's see. Um, our first question in the chat is, uh, can we start pruning plants now uh, that were that that were damaged in the freeze? Yeah, you should have started pruning two weeks after that hard freeze, because two weeks afterwards, which was late February, early March, we could already tell by then what needed to be removed. But dead is dead. Ugly is ugly. If there's no green on the top, uh, you need to take all the ugly and dead out if you have not done so, or cut back to the greenwood. Of course, you take caution with grafted trees, uh, especially citrus that are grafted because a lot of those are pushing up from the rootstock. Um, if the top's dead, it's dead. If the plants don't look like they're vigorously growing uh, by May, and of course, make it through the summer heat, we need to do some um, uh, figuring out of replacing some plants in May and then again in about September, October. Folks, simply put, there's plant shortages out there. Uh, you're going to be paying a premium price like everything else the last two or three months. Gas and fuel's been going up.
food's been going up, everything's going up. So uh, plants are gonna be the same way, but uh, green means viability and a chance to survive. May is the key point, making the summer heat is the other. And if need be replacing as late as September, October. And remember we started increasing fertilizing, nutrition, and water once new leaves start emerging. And if we don't do this on some of these perennial type plants, and we do see like Gold Star Esperanza, Mexican Bird of Paradise, and other real nice Texas Superstar type plants pushing new growth out of that bottom, it's gonna be very hard to remove that dead and ugly without damaging, bruising, or breaking that new growth on the bottom. So if you have not done so, let's get it out. Hopefully that crown of that plant is nice and firm. And, um, you know, we've lost a lot of plants. You all see it driving around the state of Texas. Uh, but uh, see if that helps and go from there. Okay, thank you, David. Our next question comes from Barbara. Uh, she wants to know, how do you manage oak tree sprouts that come up under the trees? Uh, she has many oaks with large beds outlining them and the sprouts are uh, dominating um, under one particular tree, cl cluster of trees. Yeah, that's a good question. We tend to get that often on our live oak trees and, and the, everything's yellow right now. The catkins, the male flowers, the pollens everywhere. It really gets my allergies going. So uh, they're probably gonna be a bumper acorn uh, crop uh, this fall as well. But it depends on the genetics. If you go out to native um, habitats, you normally see a one mother tree, a very old majestic live oak tree. And on the outskirts, you see what they refer to as a montelokes, oak monts. And they're all little soldiers. They're all uniform in size and shape, almost identical. And those are all soldiers, water sprouts from the root system of that mother tree. And their job is to get out there and survive and harvest uh, essential water and nutrition basically for mother plant. And then the, the little ones that come off the roots, if they survive, they make it. so. Live oaks tend, depending on the subspecies of live oaks, tends to have that inherited uh, genetic quality to it. So what do we do in these residential commercial landscapes? So the predominant soil that we have is very high buffered alkali clay type soils that tend to be a very alkali, very clay and compact, compacts the key, particularly in residential areas. So when we promote from mid-September through early April with March, early March, mid-March, being the ideal time to core aerate your lawn, core aerate your lawn to get better oxygen and gas exchange deeper, deeper in the soil profile. Remember a tree's root system, 90%, typically 90% of a tree's root system is typically six to 12 inches below the soil surface. It's hard to believe that, isn't it? So with the heavy clay soils, if we can core aerate these lawns, especially lawns, we will get that, and not only the turf grass to root in much deeper, encourage it, but trees roots as well. So that's gonna help. The other thing is many trees, unfortunately, are planted way too deep. So when you evaluate your trees this week, do you see a telephone pole in the ground? Or do you see the, the flare roots, the buttress roots emerging from that crown? So exposing the flare roots of a tree and not raising the level up to plant your petunias and things like that with excess soil and mulch and over watering right next to the crown, that's gonna relieve that issue. On the outskirts, you know, keep a well-maintained lawn, well-mowed, well-fertilized, a thick, a thick um, lawn. 
mulch, mulch, mulch in and around the areas to help eliminate light, not only from a ground cover bed, potentially plants, the lawn that will minimize it. So all those are factors to minimize this oak sprout uh, situation. Now, Mark and Mike Fannick that I know of at Fannick's Garden Center uh, has a, a product that you can spray. It's very expensive, very expensive for shoots. And I know commercially and in orchards, they use them on apples and other commercial fruit orchards throughout the country to eliminate the water sprouts, the suckers, the shoots that arise on the bottom. But I'm not sure if it lists oaks on there. So if you want to try an off-label recommendation and see how that works, you can look at that as well. But follow what we talked about already and make sure um, uh, every time you mow them, they tend to shoot up. So eliminating light uh, will help uh, as well. But you never put herbicides or brush killers on these sprouts because they're all interconnected to the mother tree. Good question. Okay, thank you, David. Our next question comes from Ling. She wants to know how many square feet does she need for her tomato plants? Uh, how often does she fertilize and how often does she water them? That's three questions, Ruby. What's the first question first? Sorry, <laughs> about tomato plants. Um, uh, what's How many square feet per tomato plant? Four by four. Four feet by four feet is ideal. Now, when you plant these little plants, man, that's a lot of space. But remember, what do plants need? Sunlight, air circulation, and you need to cage them up with a nice size tomato cage, minimum four to five feet tall, 16 to 20 inch diameter, anchor them down, and then use extension recommended varieties that we talked about, i.e. Celebrity, Tycoon, Valley Cat, Ruby Crush, which is this year's Rodeo Tomato, uh, and do determinate or semi-determinate selections. Go ahead, Ruby. Okay, how, how often do you fertilize them? I'm a very strong proponent, either container uh, plants, raised bed plants, or traditional garden uh, situations to really incorporate two inches of finished compost with six inches of the existing soil. Remember a good quality compost that's properly aged and decomposed. However, compost, which is typically manure based, is not a fertilizer. It is a soil amendment. So in, in regular traditional beds, that 1959 fertilizer that we talked about for your lawn this month is excellent for your spring and fall plantings, incorporating three to five pounds with that two inches of finished high grade manure base compost into 100 square feet. That's your pre-plant fertilizer, okay? That should give it enough juice to start the race and finish the race so we can have that and these. That's what it's all about, right? Now for container plants uh, or even tight, smaller raised beds, I would not use this formulation. I would use something such as Osmocote 18612, which is also a 312 ratio, and use it what it says on the label and go ahead and double whatever it says on that label for container plants, double it. And that's your pre plant fertilizer. And then I'm a strong, strong believer once a week for three weeks, especially on these transplants coming from the grower and retail, retail operation. Once a week for three weeks, use a water soluble fertilizer as also another supplement, uh, something like liquid hosta to grow, miracle grow, maybe I'll grow, sometimes I grow. Uh, and you should have three water soluble fertilizers 
in your arsenal because y'all don't want to eat barbecue every day. Plants are the same way, change up their nutritional needs, particularly on the water solubles. And the third one, Ruby? Uh, the third question was, uh, how often should she water the tomato plants? The easiest way to water any plant in your landscape is what, folks? When it's dry. So that's when you need to water. So that means stick your second knuckle into the ground and, and see if there's good moisture. Get a big screwdriver, a big screwdriver or a uh, old golf club and take the head off. And what do you do when you do a cake, right? The moist, use a toothpick in the cake to see the moistness content. So if you drive that in the ground four, five, six inches deep and you pull it up, you can see where the moisture content is. So that means you're gonna thoroughly deep water. When you water vegetables or any plant, you wanna minimize getting the leaves wet, of course. And, but when you do give a plant a good drink, give it a good thorough drink, thorough deep, deep drink. In May is the time when we uh, put the organic double shredded hardwood mulch out with compost. And that will help hold that moisture and even more to help cut back on the water and the heat of summertime. And the only thing I want to ask also add to tomatoes and uh, uh, vegetables in general, try to minimize pinching, cut off and pinch off any leaves that are potentially touching the ground. So skirt them up lightly when these plants are growing and the mulch in May will help because a lot of soil borne diseases that splatter from rain or water gets on those bottom leaves. And that's where we get soil diseases get into the plants. Uh, so that, that's another helpful hint to consider as well. Thank you, Ruby. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, our next question comes from Lori and she wants to know, uh, what is uh, that nasty, barfy looking clump that she finds in various places in her garden beds in the morning? It's bright yellow on top and sometimes gray or brown. And when she pokes it, it releases very fine, brown, dusty stuff. Ruby, I just ate lunch. <laughs> no, that's, that's, a, that's a, what we call a saprophytic, some people call it dog vomit. A fungus. It's a saprophyte. So what that is, it's um, uh, a smut fungus. It's breaking down uh, organic material. So you have some spores there and it's basically the hyphae is growing in the bark or the organic strands or even roots of some plants. And that's the visible out uh, sign that you see. And when you hit it or touch it, the spores come. So technically speaking, it's not really bad. It's beneficial because it's breaking down organic material. Yes, it's not a nice look to it. So either ignore it, um, get a shovel and like you would do your animal when he drops his material and, and shovel it up and disregard it or any general all purpose uh, fungicide or a little bit of powdered elemental sulfur, sprinkle a little bit on top of it will eliminate it quite rapidly. Okay, thank you, David. Our next question is uh, also from Miss um, uh, Lori. She wants, to, she says uh, um, that she cut all the dead fronds from her sago, um, but she wants to know how long should she wait to see if new growth will come? Yeah, the sago palms. I was down at Port, Port Aransas a couple of weeks ago and the Gulf Coast got hit hard, on very bad. And sagos, which is a um, palm-like plant and palms in general have been devastated, devastated. So the key is on the sago palm, a cycad is nice firm trunks, nice firm trunks. The center, which I call the candlestick, where the new leaves of fronds emerge out of, should have some feather-like, finger-like appendages. And that's where the new fronds 
want to emerge. So as long as that's nice and hasn't, hasn't been compromised and looks rotted or soft and palms in general, and you've done cut back everything that's, that's brown and only leave green, did not cut out any green at all, May is the key and warmer weather. So it's going to be 90 degrees here this week. So May is the key. If you don't see new fronds emerging from that center or from the very bottom as pups, then by the end of May, then they would need to be replaced. And as soon as that new frond looks like it's pushing out with the heat, then we want to kind of kick up the watering because you don't need to really water if they don't have any leaves, right? Then we start immediately fertilizing them. And carpool, which was here in uh, Elmendorf many years ago, now they moved to Gladewater, Texas, um, has especially palm food. And I think we better start fertilizing when those new fronds start appearing. But again, if they're not pushing by May, uh, then they're probably didn't make it, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, David. Our, our next question, she, uh, Lori has another question. She wants to know um, if, if there's any use for the catkins from the oaks um, that are falling or if she should just pick them up and put them in the green bin. Um, yeah, all those male pollen parts of catkins, oh, everything's so yellow. Uh, you know, that makes, that stuff makes me cry and sneeze a lot too. Um, rake it up, it's organic material. So you can incorporate it into one of your three uh, recycling trash cans or your well-balanced sustainable home a compost pile. You can use it as a mulch in your walkways and your vegetable uh, garden, or if you're working up the soil for new planting or, or bed preparation, just work it in like you would do with some fresh compost. So yeah, there's a use for it, definitely. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, David. Our next question comes from Ellie. Uh, she's from Laredo and uh, she says that um, she has a high concentration of clay in, the, in her soil um, and uh, some of the crepe myrtles that she planted aren't doing so well. Is there anything that she can add to her soil to help them grow? Yeah, the best thing for, for bad soil and our predominant clay soils come from our parent material limestone. So typically um, a large percentage is up down the state of Texas is very severely buffered clay, high pH soils, uh, clay calcareous type soils. Uh, some people have sand um, and some people have just rock and caliche. So the best thing to do is try to work with what you have, plant the proper plants in the right location at the right you know, sun, excellent soil drainage, not too deep in the ground. As we mentioned earlier about trees, planting them too deep in the ground, buying quality trees to begin with is all keys. So what do we talk about? Uh, compost, compost, compost. Uh, most of our soils lack organic material, okay? The best soils in the world have about a 5% organic material content to it. Here in and around the San Antonio area, a lot of us be lucky to have half of 1%. You know, when we're uh, grasslands, we're probably between three and 5% or more. Uh, so compost, 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 quality compost, aged property screen compost incorporated no more than about 20% at initial planting. If your plants are planted already, that's why we believe on a double shredded hardwood mulch, double shredded hardwood mulch that has a little bit of compost mixed into it. And if you can't find a living mulch like that, just buy the double shredded hardwood mulch and then just feather a little bit of the good compost on top of it as a living mulch. And what does good mulch do? That's why we replenish it in May and again in September, going into summer and coming out of the summer heat. When it breaks down, it becomes compost. And that's what we need to do 
uh, when it helps hold water and helps nutrition when you supplement with fertilizer become readily available. So all those are gonna be a big, big part of that. And remember with the spring push of plants, uh, you know, we've talked about 1959 already a couple of times and the different uses, you know, put this fertilizer out on the drip line of these plants, scratch it in lightly, water it in real well after you apply it. Use about a pound per every three to five feet of height. And uh, this is the fertilizer that we can use as an all purpose fertilizer, not only for your lawns, but your vegetable garden, tree shrubs, and all your other plants in the springtime. The fall is a little bit different. Okay, thank you, David. Our next question comes from Glenda from Bernie. She wants to know, um, what do we need to, to care for our lawns for right now? What do we need to do to take to care for our lawns right now? The biggest thing in the month of April is this slide right in front of us, fertilize. And nutrition is very, very critical. Uh, and we usually start fertilizing with the slow release 1959 after the second or third mowing. It has to be an active growth stage, okay? I'm not saying mowing weeds, but we never let a weed flower set seed, right folks? And I'm sure that y'all have listened to our our archive webinars uh, that we've done that uh, you've correlated the lawn, you put your lawn dressing out already uh, for the year because you wanna cut your water bill down big time in July and August. And you have a well-maintained mower. You know, we got, you know, we know where the gas goes in our car. Hopefully we know where the gas goes in our lawnmower, but we have to do maintenance on these vehicles, just like our lawnmowers, right? Same way, vice versa, right? You know, well-maintained mower is a filter in good condition, plugs, sharp blades, oil, et cetera, and get on it. And then, uh, you know, this, this and other, uh, we have, uh, I think three or four or five archived lawn webinars on maintenance, general maintenance on the My Extension 210 YouTube channel. And then I believe Molly Keck, our entomologist, has a couple on insects in the lawns as well. So everything you need to know about taking care of a lawn correctly. And folks, it's more than just mowing. Okay, thank you, David. Um, we have uh, the next question from Glenda. And she asks, uh, what is the best peach tree variety for sandy loam soil in the Atkins, Texas area? Okay, what I would do is uh, go up to Fanix Garden Center. Without a doubt, they carry the best selection of fruit trees. So it's just right around the corner where you're living there, southeast of Bear County. Ask for Mark or Mike and uh, look for uh, John Fanick Peach, named after their daddy, John, John Fanick Peach, and or a selection called La Feliciana, La Feliciana. Uh, one of those two would be the best. And then your homework assignment is for sure, for sure on peaches because peaches are input. You have to have a, a good location for them, good soil and all that good stuff. So on our Aggie Horticulture website, under the fruit tree section, all the information on growing peaches, follow it to a T and you can have some, and that includes spraying, planting, training, pruning, spraying, weed management, proper water, proper nutrition. All that information is on the Aggie Horticulture website. Okay, thank you, David. Our next question comes from Robin uh, from San Antonio. She says that uh, her Meyer lemon uh, has bloomed during uh, the snow and now it has lots of pea-sized fruit and is, and is blooming again. She wants to know when to cull the fruit and, and what is a good rule of thumb for that? Yeah, so especially young trees, be it citrus, peaches, or any fruit type tree, when they're young and even when they get older and mature, you do not want to overcrop these young trees. 
that means too much fruit load on them because it, it stresses. So a good rule of thumb for most citrus trees and most fruit trees in general, you should have one fruit to no more than two fruit per fruiting stem, ideally spaced every six inches apart. That's a good rule of thumb for all fruit in general, okay? So when they're the size of a, uh, a marble, that's when you start knocking them off. But you guys aren't gonna do this. Y'all gonna want every fruit on that tree to make it. So you're gonna have an abundance of fruit, but they're smaller and you're gonna put so much stress on these trees that next year you're gonna call us or email us or chat into us. I had a lot of fruit last year that were small. Uh, they weren't that juicy, but no fruit this year. That's called overcropping. So you gotta do this. You gotta do this. You know, spacing of the fruit is very important. And a good rule of thumb for citrus is one fruit should have 42 leaves. 42, that's what graduate students do. They count stuff like this. But we don't need you to count every leaf, but that's a good rule of thumb. Follow those and you should have. So hopefully uh, she probably protected this improved Myers lemon because all the ones that were left outside or planted in the ground, 99.9% .9 of those died. Okay, thank you, David. Um, Robin said that she promises she'll cut the, the fruit. That she'll <laughs> cut the fruit. Okay, the next question comes from Ling. Uh, she wants to know, um, she, she says that she saw a lot of worms hanging down from trees in the McAllister Park area. And she wants to know if uh, you have any information about the, the web worms this year, is it gonna be serious or, and is there any ways to prevent them? Yeah, they're oak, they're oak worms. They're little caterpillars and they look like they're parachuting out of a plane. And if the wind catches them right, they look pretty cool, but they're very small caterpillars. So remember a caterpillar is either from a moth as these are, or um, a, even from a beautiful butterfly. So, you know, caterpillars are hosts, you know, the mother, lays the eggs on host plants. So they're typically coming uh, off of live oaks. They hatch and uh, you have to keep an eye on them. Are they doing a significant amount of damage to the leaves? So we already know a lot of plants and trees were super stressed from this winter and, and drought. We're back in drought again, right folks? So, you know, you have to make an evaluation and a decision. Is it gonna be unneeded or unwanted stress on this trees? If so, you know, contact a very good reputable arborist, you know, that's bonded and insured from the San Antonio Arborist Association to get out there, evaluate your tree because it might be, we mentioned about the flare roots, not being exposed you know there's host insects to certain plants but a lot of insect and disease come about because of some other unnecessary stress that's added to the plant so certified bonded insured arborists will help with that and y'all can come up with a decision if if need be to spray these trees or not Okay, thank you, David. Our next question comes from Yulia. She wants to know about um, uh, if, she, if she should uh, cut back her trailing rosemary and sago palm um, from the freeze or leave them as is. Yeah, so late February, after we've had a couple of weeks to evaluate all these plants, we've suggested to cut everything out that's dead and ugly. Um, for the sagos, that means the only thing you should have left is any green on the tips of the fronds. Everything else that's brown needs to be removed. That needs, needs to have been done a month ago. So get that done ASAP. The rosemary, I'm telling most people, even if you just see a sprig here and there on the rosemary, uh, just re replace them. 
and there's going to be shortages of rosemary this year just replace me they'll never be a nice plant again even if there's only one or two shoots coming from the bottom woody section so keep an eye officially may or june this year and if you can find them earlier great uh, one of the next uh, Texas Superstar plant releases in 2021 is going to be an upright rosemary to kick off summertime because we love barbecuing here in Texas. It's called uh, uh, Barbecue Skewers, Barbecue Skewers Rosemary. You can use the uh, leaves for marinade or use the skewers uh, to put meat as uh, for your barbecue. So look for that variety. It's also called Gorizia. Gorizia um, from the Mediterranean region, uh, Gorizia, Italy, northern part, northeast part of Italy there. And we've been looking at that for a few years. So look for that one potentially to add to your landscape. Okay, thank you, David. Our next question comes from uh, Robin. Uh, she wants to know about um, soil testing. Uh, she says that uh, she composts and uses mulch and uses has to grow. Um, and uh, each, each of her and um, her two other um, friends uh, tested their soil. Um, there didn't seem to be any difference between the amended soil and the bed that was new and just dug. Uh, so she's a little discouraged, you know, after all that input. And uh, she said the only good report was that the compost was high in nitrogen. And so she's wondering um, why was there no difference between um, the soil that she has been amending and the, the other new beds that they had just dug? Okay, this is a very, very good question. And, and you've heard me today and in, in numerous talks in the past, the importance of nutrition. So you have to know, first of all, why are you taking a soil test? What is your purpose of this soil test? That's the number one thing. Because most people that do soil tests are doing it because they're having problems with their plants. And often it's a cultural thing. They're not watering correctly. There's disease, insect or other. That is not gonna give you any information with a soil test. 99% of the soil tests that we take in and around this area is gonna come back of what we've already discussed earlier in today's presentation. Most of the soil tests are gonna come back with the high middle number on this fertilizer is five, that's phosphorus in the form of phosphoric acid. So a lot of these tests come back the same, high in phosphorus, low in iron, very high in calcium because what is our parent materials, right? Our clay calcareous type soils, very high pH and it's a buffered pH. So the first number is nitrogen like on the 19. So your test uh, probably had some type of slow release fertilizer already in there, but otherwise very low in nitrogen. So that's a unique test. So. A soil test is also is as good as you conduct the test. So the bottom line is, I tell folks, most of y'all, unless you're an agriculture or a golf car, golf course or sports field person that has specific needs, then we should be soil testing because otherwise for most homeowners, spend that money on a bag of granulated fertilizer, granulated, much better than the liquids, much better and longer lasting, of course. Keep doing what you're doing. Build up the organic material, composting at home, mulching the top of your plants, working in no more than 20% of the organic material with the native soil, okay? But remember, compost and mulch, or soil amendments, they're not fertilizers, okay? So it depends on the type of plants. We talked about lawns, you know, basically you still need to fertilize, follow our guidelines, use this as a general purpose fertilizer, use the right plants, quality plants, 
extension recommended varieties, sun versus shade, watering, weed management, et cetera. And then you'll tell the difference. But soil tests, uh, they're iffy. And, and most people don't understand when they get the results back, you still need to fertilize these plants. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I hope that answered your question, Robert. If, Robin, if not, you can uh, um, type it in the chat and we can ask it differently. Um, okay, so the next question comes from Angela. And uh, she says, uh, is there any advice that you can give for a sloped lawn? Uh, she has sodded many times and the grass always dies on the slope. And uh, she's looking to switching to hardscape like crushed granite. Um, any suggestions, David? Yeah, so a couple suggestions. Uh, I will always go over plant material over hardscape when it's an option. So on our My Extension 210 YouTube channel, FYI, we do have a good webinar that's archived and Ruby's been doing such a great job archiving these. Thank you, Ruby, on ground covers in the landscape. So, you know, sometimes in these areas, it's too hard to mow, too hard to maintain, too hard to water. And turf grass has its place, but if we can take the less amount of turf grass and use plant material, we have a lot of options for plant material as ground covers on that ground cover webinar on the My Extension 210 YouTube channel. Uh, there's different types of aggregates. You mentioned one, that's fine. Uh, but go to like Keller's Materials, our good place that sells a ton of these different types, literally tons of, and bags of different type of aggregate and rock and see what you like, okay? See what you like, the size, the type. Uh, talk with these folks. Uh, do you need to put a weed block underneath first? Do you need to, before you do that, do you need to grade and level it, address the weeds? Do you need to put a weed fabric first? Then you put the aggregate. Do you need to tamp it down? Like the first one you mentioned, you need to tamp it down real well, okay? But if you have plant material interspersed, I do not recommend using aggregate or rock in and around plant material. Let's go back to what we've mentioned numerous times today. Build the soil using organic mulch, such as a double shredded hardwood mulch with compost. That would be the ideal way to go. Uh, okay, David, she did mention, uh, Angela did mention that this spot is under a tree. Would um, the suggestions be the same? Yeah, it'll be the same, you know. And again, with trees, we've, we've uh, reviewed question 7B today. We never put extra mulch soil or plant material up on that crown of the tree. Remember, we want a nice trunk with visible flare roots coming off that trunk. You know, I've seen people raise the trunk with three feet of excess soil and plant their little petunias and they wonder why their tree's under stress. Okay, thank you, David. Well, that seemed to be the, that's the last question in our chat. Uh, unless anyone has any other questions, please feel free to type them in our chat and we still have um, about another 15 minutes or so. So if you do have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat for us today. So while people are doing that, uh, this is be our next education, educational online session on Tuesday, April 20th at 12 noon. We'll be kind of talking quite a bit of what we've just been talking about today, but kind of things to do in the landscape at this time, um, uh, going into the May, you know, the oven turns on about mid-June kind of a few plant uh, considerations, things to do here and there throughout your landscape. Remember, these are free um, uh, webinars and, you'll, and we know that you have to pre-register and you're not guaranteed a space because we're limited on the amount of participants in these platforms. And thank you all for 
we're doing that, but we're might try to make the best of what we can do um, with these. And then, uh, of course, we've mentioned Aggie horticulture. And the uh, if you're not familiar with our Bear County Extension website, we have a lot of good information archived there and ongoing uh, programs that we do on the homepage. And of course, plantanswers.com. If you're not familiar or utilizing plantanswers.com, besides the Aggie Horticulture website, tons of great archived information uh, as well on there. And we talked about the My Extension uh, 210 YouTube channel, which has a lot, a lot of great. All we ask on that, please, is subscribe to it, subscribe to it. And we really, really appreciate it. Remember, these are free, but any support and the extras that we ask for, we would greatly appreciate as well. Any other ones that came in, Ruby? Uh, yes, sir. Um, okay. So um, Angela wanted to know um, if you could um, name the specific ground covers that would do well under the tree that's growing on the slope of her lawn. Okay, so it's not kind of shady. So you can use, uh, consider Vinca Minor, Vinca Major, limbs of purple dainty-like flowers, uh, either the low growing or a little bit taller growing monkey grass, uh, the green lirio, uh, English ivy or Algerian ivy. Again, just don't let it go up on the tree itself. Uh, and we have a, a few others archived on that online webinar on growing ground covers in the landscape. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so Glenda just wanted to um, make sure she wanted to know tips on uh, on how to, on any lawn care that she should be doing right now. So since even after the freeze and the snow is, the, is there anything different that she should be doing to her lawn right now, other than fertilizing? All your warm season turf grasses, as we see in this slide, St. Augustine, Bermuda, and Zosia, if they have been well maintained before this unusual freeze weather predicament we had, you should see very little to no weeds out there, okay? If you have weeds, you're not following a good program. So we mow, mow, mow to keep weeds in check and we pull what we can. You never let a weed flower or set seed. After the second or third major mowing, uh, then we fertilize as we've, we've mentioned a couple of times today. So this is very important, very important. It's getting dry folks. So an inch a week, is a good rule of thumb. If we can go from once a week to every 10 days, an inch a week, in lieu of significant rain, we should be watering. Y'all should be doing irrigation audits to see how efficient you water and you're not wasting water. You're getting water where it's needed, not the street or your neighbor or the brown fence or the sky, et cetera. Uh, the San Antonio Irrigation Association as you know, your plumber, electrician, et cetera, et cetera, do you have a licensed irrigator that can help you uh, with these needs? And then of course, as we mentioned with growing um, citrus, ground covers, uh, we have a, a ton of archived subject matter on insects and lawn maintenance on the My Extension 210 YouTube channel. All we're asking is for you to subscribe to it. And it's what, Ruby? Free. Yes, please subscribe to the My Extension 210 YouTube channel. There's lots and lots of great videos on there for, for everyone on there. Um, okay, so our next question comes from Maxine and uh, she wants to know, um, she, she says, our, our oak has a good number of gall wasps and uh, how prevalent uh, before you consider them a problem? Yeah, um, there's a lot of gall wasps that are out there. And if you look at them real close, and I don't remember them this bad this year. If you look at them real close, you almost think they're like little mosquitoes almost, but they're bad. They're very, very, very bad this year. And, um, 
So in reality, and there's different types of insect uh, galls, uh, oak galls and things like that. There's specific to uh, the ones on red oaks, uh, the gall um, is basically as big as a, can, can basically big as a brown golf ball. And then on live oaks underneath the leaves, they can be an array of different colors. And you usually see them going into mid to late summer, early fall. So we know plants in general with the droughts that we're in, the overly compacted soil, people not fertilizing correctly with the right products at the right time and other stress, the winter freeze, a unique freeze we had, all these put uh, stress on plants. So when it comes to these oak gall wasps, it's really not practical to try to spray the tree because the timing is usually impossible to get, get the kill that you would need. So if we keep the tree, as we mentioned numerous times with exposing the root flare of the tree, loosening up or minimizing the compact soils, mulching, deep watering, what correct nutrition, all those factors, even if you get a large infestation of these colorful galls on the underside of the leaves, you know, the, the wasp basically, when the leaf's growing and expanding, she lays and blisters the, uh, and lays the egg casing under the leaf. And that's where it forms that gall and the babies come out later uh, in the season. Uh, you, we just have to live with them. Uh, they can get pretty thick and you tend to see a summer, uh, a summer possible light drop or defoliation of some of these tree uh, species. So that's most likely going to happen besides a heavy acorn set in the fall this year. So the best way to approach this is overall good health and maintenance of the tree because trying to spray for them is not really economically feasible or practical. Okay, thank you, David. Our next question comes from Lori. Uh, she wants to know, is there any way to get daffodils to rebloom? Uh, if not, can you explain why they don't grow um, here after the first year? Yeah, those, where do they grow? They grow in Holland. So, you know, Holland's a little bit different climate than here different weather. You know, I think that even that tulip farm stuff of here, I think just closed down. I don't think they made it, which, you know, it's tulips bloom two seconds out of the year. So all these Holland bulbs, unless you're a florist, you know, growing like Easter lilies and seasonal things, you can force them, get some blooms out of them for a very short period of time. But what you need to do on like, uh, certain types of gladiolas, uh, certain types of daffodils, certain types of narcissus is go into these uh, high dollar nurseries or um, uh, these bulb things uh, and see if you can order them uh, from a Texas distributor. And what you want is what we refer to as naturalizing, naturalizing. So you want things that naturalize, like the German bearded irises that are blooming, the old cemetery irises, the white ones, you know, from old cemeteries and homestead. Those are what we want. So there are some naturalizing forms of these types of things, like uh, narcissus um, and things like that. And I think there's a couple of daffodils out there, but you need excellent soil preparation excellent soil drainage, the right amount of sunlight. You have to be patient with them when they're not blooming uh, 360 days out of the year, not to overwater or dry out that area. Um, you know, uh, so look for these at some of the uh, nurseries around town, but the key is not Holland or Dutch. Uh, you want naturalizing. And you're going to pay a premium price. There are a few out there. Um, look at uh, some of these plant sales, like at the, the uh, 
a garden club at the botanical garden and places like that, that some of these folks have them and they dig them and they, they trade them or barter or sell them. But that's what you want is naturalizing bulbs. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, um, let's see. Uh, and we have a question from Lori. She wants to know if you have any recommendations for small flowering plants in rocky areas. Small flowering plants in rocky areas. Well, it doesn't have to be rocky if you do, if you work in the compost and raise it up a little bit. But uh, there's different types of uh, sedum and succulents um, that you can consider low growing uh, uh, lantana, uh, new gold lantana and very xeric type uh, plants like that that you can consider as well. You know, when it warms up going into May, you can look at like some of the Cora of Vinca, the periwinkle, which you, can, you can't beat that color, uh, particularly with the um, a summer heat. You can try some of the uh, seasonal fall snapdragons that are more upright, like the Angelinias. And most of these are Texas Superstar plants. So you can go to the Texas Superstar website on the homepage of Aggie Horticulture as well as plantanswers.com to read up about these and possibly some other ones to consider as well. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, and looks like we have our last question in the chat from Robin. Uh, she said that she had a, a small celebrity tomato um, come through um, after the freeze to her astonishment. Uh, she had put like a little plastic uh, food bowl over it to protect it. And uh, she's taken really good care of it. She gave it a new name, the Snow Queen. And uh, she wants to know, uh, does this mean that it's a good variety that she should try um, rooting some of the slips um, from the plant for, for next fall? Well, supposedly the plant made it through the cold spell. So the bottom line, do you have, is to see if it has fruit as big as this or fruit abundant like this. So you're not gonna do any cutting to see if it performs because the plant should be green and vibrant and growing at this time. So just because it made it, it the, you know, that's great, but it needs to be vibrant and growing and then uh, has to have this right in front of you. Then if, if you meet that criteria, then yes, I would do some uh, possible cuttings on it and grow them for the fall time and see how they produce. But all that's great and I'm happy for that plant but this is what you want right there. So let's see how it produces. This is a lot of fertilizer in that one, Ruby. Okay, well, thank you, David, so much. And thank you everyone for your questions today. That seems to be the last one in the chat, David. Okay, thank you, Ruby. Thank you, Denise. I listen to my radio mentor, Bill Rohde, every Saturday on the 1200 AM lawn. In Garden Show, we also have podcasts of the show. If you're unable to listen, you can also listen to podcasts as well. Again, that's my email address. Don't forget to uh, support the Texas Superstar Plant Program. A lot of the plants that you buy, you don't realize they are superstar plants. They're not all tagged superstar plants, so encourage your nurture to tag them if you know it is a Texas Superstar Plant. To learn more about the Texas Superstar Plant Program, please visit the Aggie horticulture website because 90% of everything you see that normally survives a freeze as we just had and looks so pretty throughout the year 12 months of landscape color are usually Texas superstar plants and that's my email address if you have any questions that need to be followed up or things that need to be identified send quality images not as part of the email but attached hopefully everyone learned a little bit Thank you all, and uh, let's start growing some plants this spring and having fun and getting the children involved as well. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, everyone.